Do you know how it feels when you enjoy a game only because of its technical prowess? This has been my experience with Cop the Recruit, a 2009 Nintendo DS title that pushes the DS to its limits and I truly love it for that. But the rest of the game isn't quite as impressive. Cop was originally developed as a new entry in the Driver series, and the end product does still share some of the Driver DNA. However, it did become its own IP and it did quite a lot with it to differentiate itself. Often called a Grand Theft Auto imitator, the Driver series is primarily about, well, driving, obviously. In some games you can't even leave your car at all, some games you can leave but do nothing besides enter other cars, and some games, especially in the 2000s, attempted to juggle driving and shooting on foot, but even in those cases, driving is what you are ultimately there for. The series was taking inspiration from various movies of the past, in particular the 1970s, which featured high-speed police chases and car driving stunts. This was most obvious in the two titles set in that decade, and even in things like Driver 1 and Driver San Francisco for having, well, San Francisco as an available area. That's a city that you can't separate from those types of movies. These games have had a high barrier for entry, in particular the first title because that game does not mess around. Driver 2 was my introduction to 3D open world games, and even though it's tough to go back to it without modifying it, we still have a soft spot for the series. Especially as the Driver series did become a bit of an underdog as GTA gained immense popularity throughout the 2000s. The series hadn't been a stranger to handheld entries either, with Driver 1's handheld port and the very technologically impressive Driver 2 and especially Driver 3 on Game Boy Advance, which were 3D games on a system that struggled with it. Later in the 2000s, the Driver series made a true 3D transition to handhelds, with Driver 76 on the PSP, a side game giving more backstory to its sister game Parallel Lines. While the GBA titles were nice attempts and do deserve admiration, it really took a system as powerful as the PSP to get the full Driver experience on the go. And while the series itself wouldn't officially return to handhelds until the 3DS, Cop the Recruit shows us what almost was. Developed on the Nintendo DS as a portable driver game by the same team that did the Driver 3 port on Game Boy Advance and would later do Driver Renegade 3D on 3DS, we have a game that at times feels very driverish. The most obvious thing you'll notice is the game's graphics, and yeah, they're impressive. They are disgustingly impressive of a system it's on. This is quite hard to believe when you're actually playing it on a regular DS. If you were to play this on a small enough monitor, or if you squinted really hard, you could honestly convince yourself that this was a console game from earlier in the 2000s. And in some ways, it does look more impressive than the PSP driver game, but that was also a game that was criticised for looking unimpressive for the hardware. Up close, when you do scrutinise everything, the graphical flaws do become more apparent. The models don't hold up and the draw distance is quite bad, as you'll see rectangular prisms and pyramids just transforming into cars as you get closer. And the vehicles don't show any damage, even if they are one hit from exploding in a comical fashion. Thankfully your car will always have a health bar on screen so you'll know how close it is to damage. And while we're talking about shortcomings, the cars don't even open their doors, you just teleport inside them. But once again, given this is a 2009 title on Nintendo DS, and it's running at the smooth frame rate it is, these are understandable sacrifices. It can be a little distracting, but the fact that it manages to run at all in this state is still seriously impressive. Whether on foot or in a car, this game continues putting other Nintendo DS games to shame. I mean, the DS could do 3D exploration well, but most of the time it didn't. Whenever we got smooth 3D driving games, they were primarily games with enclosed tracks. And this isn't enclosed, it's an impressive representation of a chunk of New York City and New Jersey we're used to seeing in games like this. It's all uninterrupted and seamless. The game's bright and vibrant colour palette makes this depiction of New York and New Jersey stick out more than the grey wastelands we were getting a lot during this era. But that's probably because the bright skybox is ever present and just giving me calm thoughts. The game has two different flavours of skybox primarily, being this nice calming blue and this overbearing sunset. We do get a few other varieties which do make nice moments, but these are the two you'll be seeing the most in the game. 
there isn't a day-night cycle here. The time of day just changes based on the number of missions you've completed. This isn't an open world sandbox where you can have endless fun without a set objective. This is a little more like Mafia or LA Noir, where you can do extra stuff on the side, but primarily your drives are just commutes between missions. I personally don't mind this approach, but it would be bugging some people out there. However, unlike those two examples, we are often given multiple missions at once. And while they all need to be completed, you can go about those set ones in any order you wish, more like typical sandbox titles. This isn't really a railroad, it's just a bit more scripted than you would expect. You can't go around hurting pedestrians as they jump out of your way, and the police don't care what you do. There is no murder of innocent people here, unless you keep driving into a car so long it explodes, presumably with a driver inside. And while you're between missions, there are actually two different collectibles that you can get. One of which is these flashing signs placed by alleys which help inform the player that alleyways can be used for driving, and are often great shortcuts. This is good game design here. And I love the fact that it just makes them very obvious because some people probably wouldn't even notice them. The other collectible is photographs we take of various landmarks in the environment. We can now roleplay a tourist in New York by taking photos of these buildings, bridges, and anything else the game considers iconic. This is despite the fact that our protagonist has lived in New York for at least a few years and presumably much, much longer. Our protagonist is Dan Miles, which is a name I can't decide if I like or not, and he is a walking book of cliches. He's a detective who doesn't always play by the rules, but sometimes you need to break a few rules to set things right. And he got this job by being an illegal street racer that was turned into a cop because of his great driving ability. This is because of the Criminal Overturn program. He finds himself involved in a conspiracy, as some terrorists called Bomb Zombie are going to do terrorist things, I don't know. Honestly, I tuned out a bit during this story. Stuff happens, it escalates, it goes down the paths you'd expect. You can probably predict a lot of what will happen throughout this game. However, something neat about the story is the cutscenes that are done with still images but do still look quite nice. But it does that thing where both screens of a deer show different visuals at the exact same moment. This is a very nice gimmick I love on the DS. And while we're on the topic of meat, we get playable flashbacks to the character's life prior to the events of the story, and these will take place in winter with snow everywhere and a nice blue filter. I love the visuals here and it really sticks out. It has the appropriate slipperiness which makes driving a bit harder, and it was very fitting when this showed up later in the game just to give those last few moments an extra difficulty spike. But not everyone is here for the story. How is the gameplay? Besides the graphics, it is the most notable thing here, but notable does not necessarily mean good. Driving on its own feels good, surprisingly good. There's a satisfaction to drifts and turns, and each vehicle feels distinct. These cars are all on the weightier side, which is pretty standard for driver, but I love how they feel here. However, even though the traffic in the game is incredibly sparse, it does still mess things up. The draw distance has led to more vehicle collisions than I'd like to admit, and there just isn't an effective communication of your crash considering there is no visual damage. You'll just be driving, you'll hit something, and you'll likely just come to a complete stop, which impedes your process and just feels quite anticlimactic. You'll have to back away, correct yourself, and be quick about it, because the game is very strict. Most driving missions will involve you chasing after a vehicle, that will drive at faster than normal speeds but nothing too unbelievable, and then just after enough time they will decide to vanish into the ether, going at the speed of light. Once that happens, you will get a very dramatic game over screen, and then you'll be sent back to the nearest checkpoint, which are thankfully very common in this game. You will fail driving missions repeatedly, but you're only sent back a minute or so each time, which does lessen the pain. On one hand, these sections are needlessly difficult, but on the other hand, it just gives you that satisfaction as you'll keep playing until you master it and get through it effortlessly. It's about memorization and mastery of the controls, and it kind of reminds me of the Stuntman games, which were cut from driver's same cloth. These missions in particular require that you not only catch up with the speeding vehicle, but ram into it enough times that its health bar depletes, which is thankfully helpfully communicated especially with the aforementioned lack of model degradation. Of the driving missions, these are the most iconic and classically driver. 
But these are also the most annoying, so I guess it really does fit Driver to a T. Other than those, we'll be driving to a destination under time limits, which actually aren't too bad, but can go pear-shaped if you crashed a few too many times. And since you're usually driving to the upper end of town, they can feel a bit more punishing, but they're easy enough to get through for the most part. While these missions in themselves may also be iconic to Driver, these aren't as needlessly difficult, so it actually wasn't too bad, up until the end of the game where these really got to me. And then it truly felt like Driver again. We also have the least common but perhaps my favourite type of vehicle emissions here. These are these time trials that we have to go through multiple glowing spots. Sometimes they're done in a linear order and we have to go through them sequentially, and sometimes we're just dropped in a playground and we have to go through all of them in a time limit and we pretty much get to choose our own paths. These are both very fun, and they also aren't too difficult all things considered. In either case, even the more restricted ones, I still felt like I had more freedom in my design here, and it really made the most of the things like alleyways and the other shortcuts I had learned. These were great, and I honestly wish the game had more of them. And this is really all you do while driving. There's no shooting from the driver's seat, and these missions are just repeated constantly. They can be quite fun, and at other times infuriating, but the real gimmick is just being able to do it on the Nintendo DS. However, unlike the original Driver titles, this game has a lot of objectives outside of your car, and this is honestly my favourite part of the game, and also my least favourite part. Much like the vehicle moments, these vary a lot in quality. On foot, we move like any other third-person protagonist in an open-world game, complete with the awkward sprinting ability. While we're playing these sections, we get camera control of the face buttons, which is actually fine because these moments don't require precise camera movement or fast reactions. This is how a lot of the filler between objectives takes place. For instance, set foot in the police station and get your next objective from your lieutenant, or go to the subway station and navigate like this until you find a particular person you're looking for. These are pretty low stakes moments, but it does give you more time to just appreciate how well detailed these interiors are. When things turn up is the gunfights, which play quite differently. This game has a lot of DS antics, but this is the most apparent and the least awkward of them. We use the corner of the touchscreen to open a weapon inventory button, which is laid out in a nice grid fashion, and then we just select the weapon and we can aim it by moving the stylus across the bottom screen to aim our shots. And we just continue moving and strafing with the D-pad. In theory, this works really well, and the game highlights when we have an enemy selected which does help to reduce confusion, and as you're shooting them, you will hear the same two screaming sounds over and over, which is also good communication that you're effectively shooting them. There is no auto lock-on, and considering the amount of buttons available in the DS, using the stylus is perhaps the best option. I've seen other handheld titles from this era attempt shooting, and they don't work out as well. You can be very accurate with the stylus, but I do wish the sensitivity was higher as it can take quite a few stroking inputs to turn the camera around 180 degrees. In the more traditional missions where we're navigating an interior and shooting enemies that are all spaced out appropriately, this is actually really fun and I love using each weapon. These weapons do have very limited ammo capacity and while it can be topped up for free between missions, it will force you to improvise and use the worse weapons. The shotgun is by far my favourite weapon here, but that won't last an entire mission, and then you'll have to keep using the pistol to neutralise threats. One that I love is the automatic rifles. These have so much recoil, the cursor actually moves up after each shot, meaning you have to then recenter it. This is a nice detail that helps prevent spray and prey. By default, you'll shoot with the L button, which means you're holding the stylus with one hand and the system itself with the other hand. This is surprisingly comfortable, and we won't have to touch the face buttons during these moments, so you won't be awkwardly clawing at the system. And thankfully, this game does have options for left-handed players, which allow you to change up this configuration. And we also get the option to bind shooting to the touchscreen as well, for people that want to do as much as humanly possible with just the stylus input. The environments you'll be shooting in do a lot to make these sections more enjoyable, because let's face it, this game is not a masterpiece in terms of shooting. While this game is always beautiful for the hardware, it is at its best in these interior sections. You'll only spend a few minutes in the supermarket across the whole game, and it's needlessly detailed with aisles of groceries including coffee, but it feels truly alive and more detailed than it has any right to considering the amount of time you'll see it. 
Another highlight is later in the game when you're in a sinking ship and the water is pouring in through this slanted mess. They went above and beyond. This is a place you'll only see for a small portion of the game, but it truly looks like no other part. All these moments are wonderful to look through and it almost makes up for the other sections of the game where you'll be going trigger happy. Shooting in confined linear environments is fun in this title. Staying put in a small title fending off waves of enemies isn't. These moments will see you protecting another person who doesn't have a visible health bar so you won't know when they're about to die. And they love just running in front of the enemies instead of getting cover. You need to stand guard and fend off the attackers who will come at you whenever they feel like it. And unfortunately, you'll fail the mission if you leave the permitted area, meaning you'll just have to shoot them from a far away distance or wait for them to come to you. Either way, it's insufferable. And while that all on its own is terrible enough, this is when the enemy AI really got on my nerves. I can accept the AI not being well designed here. Frankly, I wasn't expecting it to be considering just how many resources went into rendering this game's graphics. But the enemies have a very fun tactic of standing in front of you, shooting a couple times, and then walking like three steps to either side and shooting you again, rinse and repeat. You don't have a melee attacking option or a lock on, you'll just need to keep re-angling your aim with your stylus so this becomes quite tedious and frustrating as by the time you've recentered it they've moved again meaning you have to continue this process until you're able to shoot them dead. All the while they're shooting you or the person you're protecting and you'll just fail the mission either way. There are also some brief moments where we have to select the position of SWAT members across a room and then shoot the enemies in that room. This can be made easier or harder based on how effective your positioning was earlier, so that these moments are few and far between, and just serve as another way to repackage shooting without wearing out the formula. These are preferable to the shooting I just mentioned, but they're not as good as the more linear, tightly designed ones. Shooting is a mixed bag, because I love it when it's not just protecting someone and I hate it when it is, but there is surprisingly more variety in terms of on-foot gameplay. The next most common of these is the forced stealth sections, which were surprisingly fun. I usually hate forced stealth sections in games not built around it. This game's approach is dumbed down enough and effectively communicated with the player, but I didn't actually find myself disliking it. This game does still have the drawback of instantly failing as soon as you're spotted, but it is mitigated due to the generous checkpoints and shorter mission design. But even ignoring that, we have very obvious sight lines displayed on the bottom screen at all times, and the guards do not care about anything besides that. There is no noise meter to worry about, and you could be running in front of what is their periphery vision, but if it's outside of that triangle, you're good to go. This leads to nice clutch moments where in any other game you'd be caught, but here you're just doing risky plays and getting away with it. These guys don't even care if you shine a light in their eyes in a dark room. And what makes these missions even more entertaining is the Nintendo DS-ness of it. You have to distract guards by speaking into the microphone. This causes guards within the circumference to investigate, which means they'll walk over in a way which isn't necessarily the most effective or realistic way, but it does get them out of the way. This isn't an in-depth stealth system, but it's a nice little puzzle where we have to know when and where to use the auditory distractions so we can walk into a particular field without being shot. It's a fun distraction and the game lets you take your time with these, which is a breath of fresh air, considering just how nail-biting the rest of the game can be. Those are all the basic gameplay sections that matter. There are a few other things like operating security cameras, recording the audio of someone just walking in a circle, and the most prevalent of the extras, the fire extinguisher, which is just a fire extinguisher, it's not that exciting. They're all there just for the sake of variety and they do their job well enough, but they're nothing I really want to dwell on. Outside of gunplay, we do still get quite a bit of use of the DS stylus. The most fitting of this is when we have to make waypoints, which is done through this game's expansive list of locations, meaning we can pull up the directory and set a waypoint. You can do this while just sitting there, or if you know how to master looking at two screens at once, you can actually make a waypoint while you're driving. I knew all those hours I sunk into Star Fox Zero was worth it. We also use the stylus in these number of recognition sections where the game will tell us to enter a specific three digit code and it'll only accept that code, but we have to write these numbers. It does use relatively impressive handwriting technology to interpret our numbers and it didn't mess up too much, but even if it worked flawlessly, this is just pointless busy work that interrupted the flow. I can safely say I was not a fan of these sections. 
Copter Recruit is just this overly ambitious game and I love it for that. It threw everything it could and went above and beyond to give us a 3D open world environment and fast paced shooting and driving. And while it didn't excel in any of these fields, it did a good enough job. This is a good DS game, but it would be pretty mediocre if it was on any other system. This is good because of the hardware it was on, much like playing a Game Boy Advance first person shooter. This wouldn't be great if not for the limitations. The game is rough, driving around feels soulless, and the story isn't good enough to justify it either. This isn't a must play title, and while reviewers criticised it for not being as fun as GTA Chinatown Wars, as if you're only allowed to play one of these games and these are a direct competition, they were still right at the end of the day. There are more fun titles on this system. There are more fun titles in this genre and other systems. And there are more fun games in the Driver series, which I know this technically isn't, but it still does feel similar enough. This is still a game I am glad to play, and I would recommend it to anyone that wants to see technical expertise of a Nintendo DS, or just wants a rough and mediocre, but ultimately pretty fun experience with brutal difficulty spikes. I had fun now, and I'll put it back on my shelf, and I'll never think about this game again. At least until I play Driver Renegade 3D and realize these two games have far too much in common.